So we had this plan to put streets and blocks and add some bridges and really make it into something and get rid of the freeway to open the city up to the lake. And I think eventually it'll happen. There's a growing feeling in Buffalo, a growing sense of confidence. And when we tore down the freeway in Milwaukee and made a big difference, the physical, just being able to get rid of something that's so ugly. And I had the DOT resurface the damn thing three years before we finally got it torn down because they wanted to create results on the ground. They went out of their way to try to make it hard to do what we wanted to do. But eventually we outmaneuvered them. And I think the same thing could happen in New York. So we had our freeway, eight-tenths of a mile long. The land use pattern went from buildings to surface parking lots on the river going through the town so that you could park your car there and you could gaze out over the river, the headlights facing out over the river throughout the day while you're in your workplace. <laughs> um, and then, you know, that was the plan. And the downtown is, you know, all these buildings are being built. Without subsidy, most of them, I have to confess, is a few. Uh, I, would, uh, I would tell my development staff that uh, they got extra credit if buildings were uh, groundbreaking, if there were groundbreakings, no groundbreakings for the buildings, and no ribbon cuttings. Because that would mean that the city didn't have any subsidies in it, and uh, we didn't have to do anything special. Uh, and what I meant by that was we wanted the development process to become so natural that the city didn't have to be that involved. Uh, you know, strong code ca causing the urban form to happen, but uh, not having us here having a public-private partnership. <laughs> when I hear people say, oh, we need more public-private partnerships, no. I mean, occasionally a public-private partnership makes sense, but we actually need less public-private partnerships. I think cities need to be places that naturally develop and not have these things where you've got some shyster who knows uh, all the people down in the city hall and goes out of maneuver around uh, doing a public-private partnership with is basically him putting his hand in the city treasury and taking the people's money and stuffing it in his pocket. Uh, and so we got rid of the subsidies in the downtown. We went from like two developers to like 30 developers, and most of them were much smaller because they couldn't afford a lobbyist anyway. Uh, and so the development process becomes more natural. Now another city that's transforming itself is because of the natural uh, earth, from an earthquake is Seattle. The Alaskan Viaduct, which is a freeway uh, right in front of the downtown waterfront. It starts out at surface level south of downtown, goes back to surface, not a freeway north of downtown. So they just have the freeway in front of the downtown, which is really dumb. Because the downtown, most of the traffic is going downtown and you need the egress, uh, ingress and egress, deliveries and commuters, and they all want to go into the street grid and this thing forces them to just go into a few uh, spots. So that's the way it looks. Uh, we went to the governor's people, along with the Waterfront People's Coalition, and the Pioneer the Square Business Association, all the opponents of the freeway. And we met with the DOT people, and they said, well, Seattle's a big city. It needs a freeway. We can't get along without it. We have to have it. You know, forget about the idea of tearing it down. Um, so I said, well, you know, a little over 100 miles north, you have Vancouver. They don't have any freeways anywhere in the whole city. There's nothing. And they seem to get along. That's about the same size as Seattle. What's wrong with that? And, uh, you know, there's Vancouver, no freeways. Uh, but maybe they said, well, you know, I don't know how they do it, but, you know, it'd be terrible if we didn't have it. I said, well, they must be suffering up there. Let's give them a freeway. Let's put the electric <laughs> how much better off we are for a ground level. You know, this would be the... <laughs> or Portland, where they took out a freeway in 1973, went along the Willamette River right at the front of the downtown. Let's put it back. You know, would that improve things? But the idea when it was there, and a lot of those buildings weren't there at the time because the city hadn't developed as well. But at the time, you know, having that there, seemed essential. You know, how would you how would you ever get downtown without the freeway? You couldn't even get there. But you can. I mean, can, 
Can you imagine doing that to Paris? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the freeway? You know, how do people ever get around Paris? But in, you know, in Detroit, just think about it. If they build that other bridge next to the Ambassador Bridge, if they do that other bridge, are they going to build it so that it has these huge ramps and barges through the city and tears down more buildings because they couldn't possibly imagine anybody moving uh, from the end of the bridge you know, through part of the city, it, it, so they'll do more stuff like this. You know, I mean, why not be like Paris? Why be, you know, I mean, is Buffalo the model for Detroit? Is Detroit the model for Buffalo? You know, why not? Uh, Paris would never allow this sort of thing. In fact, they have an underground freeway in Paris that's in the bank of the Seine, and that's where Princess Di was killed. They're removing it. It's out of sight, they're still removing it because all it does is concentrate traffic and create congestion in the nodes where it comes back into the city. So they're getting rid of it. Now, what I want you to see here, this is a wetland. And for 200 years, the American government had a war on wetlands, wastelands, swamps, you know, get rid of them. Uh, but now we know that. Even the Army Corps of Engineers knew better. In 1999, they issued an apology for what they had done to the Everglades. And so we now know wetlands are valuable. It's a great setting for plants and animals. It's, it's uh, wetland is, it can absorb water. It absorbs water congestion, okay? So let me cast an analogy, you know, it absorbs water. See, you don't want to do this. All you're going to do is speed up the water and it's now no longer a setting for valuable plants and animals. It's a setting for uh, rats. No. I mean, rats have a right to live, I suppose. <laughs> but, you know, there's no, you know, it's not a valuable setting for plants and animals anymore. So we don't do this so much anymore. It still happens once in a while. You know, congressional earmark, somebody has a dumb idea to pay the stream. Uh, but, so the, but the Army Corps of Engineers, and the water engineers, they now understand wetlands are useful. It absorbs uh, flooding. It absorbs, it, it's a setting for valuable stuff. But look at, you know, this is uh, Wisconsin Department of Transportation. Well-planned transportation systems enhance safety and traffic. Well, that's not true. But, uh, I mean, the death rate on the freeways is much higher. The faster you go, the more likely you are to die in an accident. Getting above 37 miles an hour is automatically fatal for pedestrians, for example. But, uh, anyway, but this is, this is what they think the road hierarchy, this is what they pay for. Freeways, arterial roads, the collector roads, the service roads, they'll pay for that. And this is the stuff they don't pay a dime for, the local roads. That's where all the value is. That's where the economic value is. That's where the cultural value is. And that's what the federal and state programs don't pay for. So the, where the value is, they don't invest in. They invest in the stuff that doesn't produce value. Now granted, freeway makes sense if you want to go uh, you know, deliver um, uh, some steel from um, Gary, Indiana to Toronto, you go through Sarnia, and, you know, you don't really want them to go along a quaint street across Michigan and, you know, all this stuff. So you, you, there's reasons to have, you know, roads that are big. But in the city, they don't go on. And, and the, this is the only model. You know, moving trucks is not the only purpose of America. And it shouldn't be the only thing we invest in is, is the giant uh, roads. And, and, and this is what happens even you know, with the arterial roads. It's only about movement of vehicles. Look, the pedestrians have to make their own muddy path. Uh, the, the arterial road that is taught now in the engineering schools, the smallest one they really promote is is uh, the 72 feet of pavement, three lanes of traffic, 20 foot median, so you can have a double pork chop turn lane, and then the pedestrian is left to walk in the mud, or alternatively, walk in the gutter. 
And this is the American love affair with the automobile. Here's your choice. You can be a real American driving one of these vehicles, or you can be a criminal suspect. <laughs> That's our love affair. That's the choice. That's the what the government spends all the money on the vehicles and screw the guy that wants to walk. Now what kind of deal is that? Now this is the wetland. This is the analogy, the street grid, the complex street grid, in this case, Washington, D.C., L'Enfant's plan as amended by Daniel Byrne. And it's still valuable today. It's a great valuable setting for real estate. Uh, and it needs traffic. The Connecticut Avenue, which is right up there through DuPont Circle, uh, it even has a really cool grade separation at DuPont Circle, so the engineers had something really cool to do. But the street mostly intersects with the street grid. So if it congests at rush hour, you don't have to stay on it. You can go on, the, on one of the other arterials and get where you want to go. Uh, and so at rush hour, at the peak half hour, Connecticut Avenue goes at 8 to 13 miles an hour. The Potomac Freeway, you're stuck. At peak hour, it's 3 to 6 miles per hour. Now, in the middle of the night, at 2 in the morning, Connecticut Avenue is slower. The freeway is really fast. But when you need it the most, it coagulates. It's, it comes to almost a halt. And so that's what we're investing all this money. And then making them bigger. When it coagulates, then they just make it bigger. And for a while it works, but then eventually it coagulates again. Here's the street grid in Madison. There's no freeways in Madison, Wisconsin, in the downtown. There's all these state employees there, the university nearby. When rush hour comes, if one street is congested, you go over to the next one. You use your brain. You have choices. You don't have some uh, traffic engineer deciding for you that you must go on this one road. And we'll make the road, if you're dumb enough to keep going on it, we'll make it bigger and bigger. We'll collect more taxes from you and keep making it bigger. And we'll tear down the place it's in and make it worth less and less. That's our transportation policy. It's really stupid. And I'm not against pavement. The, the Congress for the New Urbanism is more for pavement than any environmental group in America. We just want pavement to add value to the settings it's in. Streets, avenues, boulevards. Woodward Boulevard or Woodward Avenue in Detroit adds value to the city. It's a wonderful street. And so we work with, the really good news is the Institute of Transportation Engineers, which is a very, very uh, traditional group, wonderful professional organization. They're not radical at all like we are, but they, we work with them for five years, with FHWA too, which, you know, that's uh, three cheers for FHWA for doing that. Uh, and we produced this book which came out in March, uh, Walkable Urban Thoroughfares, a Context Sensitive Approach. And what it does is just say, it's okay to do a pole, it's okay to do an avenue, it's okay to do a street, uh, that's legitimate. You can do that. You don't have to feel guilty if you're a traffic engineer. You can actually build a, a, a street that's appropriately scaled for an urban place, and you don't have to feel like you're violating something. Now, it hasn't actually. I went at a meeting with the Illinois DOT. Uh, they want to build this giant, great separated road in Elgin, Illinois. The mayor doesn't want it. The city council doesn't want it. They just want it to be a street. And they're ramming it down their throat. So I go to the meeting, and the Illinois DOT plays a trump card. They say, well, fine, all this CSS stuff is fine. But uh, you know, we have to worry about the safety. And we're liable. We have to worry about safety. OK, well, what are the safety? What's the safety? Uh, they, they bring up that issue all the time. It's on the big, fast roads where the fatalities happen. There's sure, you get on the narrow little roads, They'll be fender benders. But you know, I-80 in, in, uh, near Chicago, uh, they're gonna, they want to build another freeway about 15 miles south of it because of safety. I looked at the statistics. All of the deaths on I-80 were when the road was, it were off peak hours when the road was running at full speed. None of the deaths happened when the road was congested in, in uh, 2003, which was the time period they used. I looked at their own data. 
It, they're not making it safer. They're going to kill people by increasing the capacity on these high-speed roads by their own by their own uh, message. Now, one other thing I want to another specialty that could be dangerous. I love I love Al Gore. He's a great guy, and I love that he raised the issue that he did about global warming. But he talks about it in terms of you know green roofs or light bulbs. And we ought to do all that, I mean, especially the light bulbs, you know, make them more efficient, everybody should do it. But you know, Western Europe uses about half the energy that we do in the United States per capita. And the principal reason for that isn't because of light bulbs. They're not any particularly faster on the draw having electric, they're having efficient light bulbs than we are. It's because of settlement pattern. It's because they have more compact, development that's served by transit, more people walk for more things, more people, they use, they have cars, almost as many cars as we do, but they don't use them all the time. And he doesn't even mention that. And so there's a problem with this idea that if we just do gizmos that are green, that we're going to solve all of our problems. We're not going to solve them. This is a gold award lead building in the outer suburbs of Chicago for the HSBC Bank, that's the Hong Kong Bank, um, their regional headquarters, they were, before, they were right on a metro line, a commuter line in Chicago. And a lot of their employees used transit. They were, they had a lot of the housing around where they were. And they moved to this uh, cow pasture, literally, you can see the cows. But they got a gold award because they had some turf on the roof and they have the uh, some thermal glass, and they had uh, you know dry water system in their toilets and things like that. Wonderful, but the energy that they saved with the, those few things was totally blown away by the fact that everybody that worked there all of a sudden had to drive. So what is that? That's not green. That's the opposite of green. That was a really bad thing. They should have a. They should get a black flag award for polluting the world. It's terrible. And so we went to the Green Building Council and said, what the hell are you doing? And they said, OK, now that you mention it, <laughs> you're right. So let's change it. So now we have LEED MD, Neighbor of Development, which uh, takes location efficiency and factors it into their stuff. And it's, it's in place now. It'll take a couple of years for it to really bite. But, uh, you know, you've got to think of these things comprehensively, which is my point about over-specialization. You end up ruining stuff when you let the specialists take over. So this ought to get a ward instead. The Pearl District, in, uh, it's totally new neighborhood, all new buildings, and go by streetcar. Uh, you know, densely populated place, although I'll hasten to point out that Detroit has more people per square mile than Portland. It's denser, certainly <coughs> dense enough to put the streetcars back in. And Portland's getting richer all the time, the population's going out, the real estate market's even buoyant now, even during the recession. You know, why choose, why go with this dead, dreary, uh, you know, highway building program. You know, wh why keep doing that in Michigan? Stop. I mean, if they don't want to do good stuff, then just stop doing the bad stuff. Uh, that would help Detroit recover, and the suburbs around Detroit recover. All right, and then finally, I wanted to uh, close up by expressing my skepticism about the latest rage in Detroit. You're always looking for that thing that's going to say, you know, there'll be a star in the east. And suddenly, Detroit will be saved by some miracle activity that will happen. And the latest one is to turn Detroit into a farm. <laughs> okay, there's, there's 60, it's either 57,000 or 67,000 square miles of Michigan, including the UP. Okay, so you've got a lot of wilderness and farmland. There's 140 square miles in Detroit. So in terms of the percentage of the farm economy that's going to end up in Detroit, let's say you used half of Detroit as farmland, it's not going to make a dent in the Michigan agricultural GNP. 
So that's not, and you know, the people that are for doing this aren't really saying that. So in fairness, it's a, and this is such a cool poster that, you know, I'm, I'm sucked in. I'm ready to go. You know, let's do something. All right, farm, the farm thing can, can be meaningful, but it's not meaningful as a salvation. It's not a question of converting the land. In. Detroit needs to rebuild a city itself as a city, just like Warsaw did. Just like Berlin and Rotterdam, there's no, they have those cities, I mean, Rotterdam was like level, except for the cathedral, which miraculously survived. Everything was level, Warsaw, every, almost every building torn down, the whole damn city. Hitler spent 30 some days tearing the buildings apart. He didn't want one brick left together. The whole thing's rebuilt. Detroit doesn't have to say, well, we'll never rebuild. But how can you rebuild when you have uh, you know, a zoning code that requires off-street parking on all the buildings when you don't need parking. You know, it's a, all these burdens. That are, when you have a DOT that keeps one of these little rural highways in the middle of the city. So Detroit can come back. But you, the farm thing could be useful in that food distribution. There should be a food policy. You know, you should have grocery stores. Like the inner city of Milwaukee has major grocery stores. Milwaukee has two Whole Foods. The demographics of Milwaukee are a little bit different than Detroit, but not that much. Um, and, you know, so we have that. And we have a food distribution system that has, uh, you know, lots of fresh vegetables going into the central city. Now, you know, Detroit, there is land available. You could have a lot more gardens. You have small gardens, big gardens, gardens like the one at the White House. You could have window gardens. Uh, you can have, uh, you know, patriotic gardens. You can have gardens on roofs. Or like Will Allen. You know, Will Allen is the one, a lot of people bring him from all over. He's been to Detroit. He's a farmer. He's got, you know, 600 acres or something under till. But almost none of it's in Milwaukee. He has his, his headquarters is in Milwaukee. And he's got a little bit of bacon land that he bought up. But most of it is out in the countryside around the city. And he produces a lot of uh, produce and takes it to market and does CSA, the bags of groceries that go out and are distributed through the neighborhood. He's changed the diet of a lot of people in Milwaukee, in the poorest neighborhoods and in the richest neighborhoods. He serves both. He charges more in the richer neighborhoods. <laughs> the distribution. Uh, no, because he can charge more in the good. Uh, but you know, that's a model, but he's talking about distributing food, just like distributing traffic. You know, like you, you don't, the traffic thing doesn't have to have free flowing traffic no matter what. The food thing doesn't have to turn Detroit into a farm. <clears throat> what you want is the, the food system should serve the people of Detroit and make it more valuable, make the suburbs more valuable, make the city more valuable. It's about improving the system about farm markets, and you've got good stuff here. You've got the Eastern Market. This is in Madison, the farm market there, right? The Eastern Market, that's something to really build on. It's fabulous, and it can be much more fabulous. Um, and we're having our annual meeting in Madison next year, and Will Allen will be there, and uh, it's June 1 through 4, not that far away if you want to come to it. Some of the people that are here today have been to the Congress as many times. They're always useful. And if you want to know more about me, you can always buy my book, which is in its third printing. Uh, you can get it online, The Wealth of Cities. And with that, uh, let me try to turn the computer on. I mean, somebody else will do that. Uh, by the way, I just want to say, you know, the, there's a lot of talk about urban renaissance, and then we have a recession, and people but the urban renaissance is coming back. It's a return to norm. And Detroit will, in its own way, come back. It'll come back faster without these superhuman, miraculous efforts. You know, like the freeway was supposed to save Detroit, and the rent center was going to do it, and all the sports stuff was built, and casinos are supposed to save Detroit. And that does, none of that stuff works very well. But what, what it does work is the complexity of the city, the interest in the history of the city, the people of the city, all the different things, the university, all of this comes together 
and makes a, a city come back to life. But when I was in Buffalo just a week ago, they have the Medical Innovation Center with all these little businesses that are forming. And they're really making money and they're competing, they're having to expand it. Things get bigger all the time. And it's the one most hopeful thing I found in Buffalo, where people really want to be here. They want to be in that neighborhood. They want to be in, around it. And they're starting to sense a feeling of, uh, of success. And I think that is going to increasingly happen in Detroit. And it, the, the dialogue you've had has been too apocalyptic. It's been too focused on trying to find instant salvation. The place is already, I mean, just look at your art institute with the, the uh, Diego Rivera, and just the, the architecture of the city is unbelievable. The history of the city, the labor history, the manufacturing history, just outside of the auto, not just the auto industry, but all the other stuff. The Great Lakes history, all those things matter a lot. And the city needs to heal itself and come back. And it's been killed with a thousand cuts. Some of them have been brutal. Um, but it is a lot. And it's going to come back strong. And I hope tonight it helped you uh, sense uh, part of the direction. For the Thank you.